I recently found out I can buy my own breadboard clips and make my own 3D printed breadboards in any color, shape, or size, and I wanted to print them on my Bamboo Labs A1 Mini. But I got a problem in the slicer, and this machine caught it. It gave me a warning that I was getting a blob, similar to what the K1, K1 Max did that ruined my hot end. But this thing gave me a warning so I could actually remove it before it became a problem. I'll explain it all on today's Film It Friday. This video is sponsored by PCBWay.com. I saw this post on Twitter by Kevin Santo Capuccio where he lit up the back of a breadboard with LEDs. It was so amazing to me, I had to find out more. I found out he sells these custom breadboard clips with a notch underneath for a surface mount LED. And he sells them for 25 cents each, but he was nice enough to send me a bunch of them to play with. And I also wanted to make my own breadboard to start. And he had displayed that as well. So I asked him, did you design it? Can I get the STL? And he says, yep, and it's totally open source. And he gave me the link. So I was able to download his breadboard. And from there, I could load the STL into Tinkercad and start chopping it up and playing with it, making all kinds of breadboard shapes and sizes. So I wanted to start with a little simple breadboard to start and no LEDs. It's a small, detailed design. So I thought this may be perfect for the Bamboo Lab A1 Mini. So I brought the design out of Tinkercad and brought it into Bamboo Lab Studio to be sliced. I sliced it, I ran through it quickly, everything looked good. So I sent it to the printer. And then the printer stopped. I got a warning message on my phone, so I checked it out, and it's giving me this message that something's wrong with the build plate. And I didn't see it at first. But then I looked at the nozzle, and the nozzle was covered with the print. It didn't stick. So I thought, well, maybe I got a you know dirty build plate or whatever, but it actually caught the fact that it was starting to build a blob on the hot end. And I thought, this is amazing. Because I actually just went through this on my K1C and on a K1 Max, where I had to replace the hot end in both cases. I mean, an $800 or almost $800 3D printer can't catch a blob, but this $199 printer can give me a message and actually stop the print? I couldn't believe this. Now, I'm not exactly sure how I did it. I assume it's through this camera that you can see on the right-hand side here, watching for a spaghetti detection or the print lifting off the bed. And to give me the warning and stop the machine so I could actually remove the blob before it became a problem, that's an incredible feature for $199. Now, the K1C, K1 Max, they have a camera inside, and they advertise that the title of their printer is the K1 Max AI speedy 3D printer. So if it's got AI, can it do it? If anyone knows, let me know in the comments below because I don't see that feature anywhere. Now I did actually print this on the K1 Max as well and that first layer came out much better. It printed it fine and went all the way up to a finished print and the quality, it's pretty good. I wouldn't say it's perfect, but it's pretty good and it looks like the clips are going to fit fine. I did clean the bed on the A1 Mini just in case I had a problem there, but when I ran it a second time, it failed again. It didn't stick to the bed, although it didn't stick to the nozzle, it still failed. So I went back to the slicer, there's got to be an answer here. So I looked at more detail and the first layer of the A1 Mini slicing didn't have the grid. The second layer did, but that first layer should have printed the grid. I mean the design is flat. As you can see here, the parts that printed are right on the same surface as the first layer of the grid. So since the K1 Max printed it properly, I went back and looked how it was sliced, and the first layer shows the grid. So there was a difference here between the slicing of these two. So I thought, well, maybe the line widths are different. So I looked at the line width settings for the A1 Mini in Bamboo Studio, and then I went and looked at these settings on the K1 Max, and they're identical. The exact same settings in the profiles that I used. So I went to the preview mode and selected line width. And you could see here the parts that printed were within the line width settings, but there weren't a lot of choices here. It jumped around. But when I went to the K1 Max, there were a lot of line widths below the settings in the slicer. And I thought, why is this different? And then it occurred to me, what type of slicing is it doing? The wall generator was showing Arachne on the K1 Max, but when I looked at the A1 Mini, it was set to classic. One of the advantages of the Arachne slicer is it will vary the line widths where the classic won't. And that was probably the problem. So I set the A1 Mini to Arachne, sliced it all again, 
and I'm seeing different, not as much as the K1 Max, but I'm seeing different settings on that first layer. And sure enough, the first layer printed the grid or showed the grid. Let me switch back to the line type so you can see it better. And here it is. The first layer, the grid is complete and full. So it looks like that's why it was lifting and sticking to the nozzle because I didn't have a proper first layer. So now I sent the Arachne slice version and the first layer printed pretty good. It's still got some extra little blobs there, but the overall print stuck and completed and it came out pretty nice. About equal to what I was getting in the K1 Max. Now it's a little different filament, but they both came out pretty good. So now I want to try them out and I do have these double-sided PC board kit. They're great for quick prototypes because there's just a bunch of holes you can easily solder to or jumper wires to. So the clips fit perfectly on this board. So I wanted to see if I could make a little development board. So I flipped it over, soldered all the pins on one side of the clips, and then I add an 8-pin socket and a programming header. And now I just need to add the breadboard. So will it fit? So I slid the breadboard over the top of the clips, and I checked it on both sides to make sure everything lined up, and it did. And now it's just a matter of force, pushing this down onto the clips to form the breadboard. And there it is. And I'm exposed on the sides right now because I could jump our wires in there or probe it. So it's really just a prototype just to test if this works. And wire jumpers go into this beautifully, just like a real breadboard. So I'm really impressed with how good his clips work and the fact that I can design my own breadboard, take a cheap little board like this and turn it into a development board. And I can change colors. I can slide the red one off and pop the gold one on or whatever I want to do and make a different breadboard. So this has a lot of potential. I got to play with it a lot more. Now I just use these low cost proto boards and I have to jumper wires to make it work. So instead I'm going to design a circuit board for it and I'm going to get that at PCBWay.com because I can get 10 pieces for $5 plus shipping. I can even have them assemble it because they got assembly services. But they also offer CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication, and injection molding. So if you need a real detailed version, you can have them 3D print it or injection mold it. So you can just upload your file and they'll give you an instant quote if you want more than 10 pieces even or certain features. And you can upload your .stl file and they'll give you a quote on that as well. So check out PCBWay.com. Now, of course, the next step is to design a circuit board to take advantage of that cutout for surface mount LED. That'll fit nicely right in there, and then I can make my own circuit boards that light up. Maybe even make it so it lights up and tells you how to connect certain circuits for a beginner. I don't know. There's a lot you could do with this, but I'll save that for a future video. So I want to thank Kevin for sending me a bag of clips so I can experiment with this. I'll put a link to it in the description below so you can get some of your own if you're interested. And I especially want to thank my Patreon supporters. Without them, I couldn't keep doing what I'm doing. So thank you, and if you want to join us, join us at Patreon.com. If you like what I'm doing here, maybe check out some of the videos popping up. If you want to help support the channel, Patreon is one way, or a membership at Thangs.com. And if nothing else, click on the logo and subscribe. I'll see you next time right here at Chuck Hollowbuck's Electronic Products and Filament Friday.